Good morning, everyone, and hello. I'm Glenn Ahrens, OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River Counties, and it's my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School Online webinar. Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resources Institute for leading this project and to the U.S. Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover expenses. Tree School Online webinars are scheduled every Tuesday from now until July 28th. Two webinars each Tuesday, one at 10 in the morning and the other at 3 in the afternoon. Some housekeeping details. Uh, the Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see that, you can scroll your cursor over that area and it should pop up. On some hardware, such as iPads, the toolbar may be on the top of the display. Audio is muted for attendees. Uh, video is also not available. Uh, but we want you to send written questions uh, in the Q&A box, which you'll see on the Zoom toolbar. And we'll be monitoring that and asking them at, uh, at intervals. We're asking that all of your questions for the presenters be written in the Q&A box, and we're not able to take spoken questions. The chat is to be used if you're having problems, um, and we'll be monitoring that. My co-host, Julie Woodward, is in the background looking at the chat. Uh, please don't post questions in chat, but use the Q&A. And the chat can be also used to talk um, to panelists and participants other than questions about the presentation. Also, there will be resources uh, posted. There's a handout that Charles has provided uh, be posted on the Tree School Online class guide. And you can reach that from Tree School Online uh, on the web at knowyourforest.org. Click on the webinar description, and then you can look into the webinar, all the webinars past and, and present, uh, and find the resources posted for each webinar. And there'll be a link to instructor resources. These webinars are all being recorded. They'll be archived as YouTube videos accessible from the Tree School online page. Also going to have some polls where we uh, ask you, the audience, some questions um, at the beginning and the end. It should pop up on your screen in a box. And after you answer the questions, uh, the poll can be closed. If you don't see the poll, you can check the toolbar for a lighted button. And it should work. If you click that button, it should pop up. I uh, have a, a disclaimer. Uh, the views and opinions expressed by our speakers are theirs and theirs alone, and not those of OSU, OFRI, or the Partnership for Forestry Education. Uh, and one other thing I want to point out is if you are a logger and you want professional logger credits through Associated Oregon Loggers, uh, those are available. There's a form um, online with the resources for the webinars. So now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Charles Lefevre and uh, really fascinated by the background and I'm really glad I get to uh, tune in because I've never been able to attend one of his uh, webinars in the past, one of his lectures. So, so Dr. Charles Lefevre started out as uh, in physics and chemistry. Uh, he worked with nuclear materials, radioactive compounds for medical research, and then somehow he, he switched to fungi, went to the University of Oregon um, and got uh, interested in fungal endophytes of Douglas fir, which leads us to the topic of truffles. Uh, spent years developing uh, various, using his chemistry background and biotech companies. But then he really got deeper into truffles for his doctorate, uh, said that it began as an underground project, uh, pun intended, but true, quietly on the side. Um, he went back and got a doctorate uh, looking at working with folks at OSU. And at the same time he was finishing that degree, studying uh, truffles, he started a new company, New World Truffier, um, which was producing you know, commercial inoculation of, of truffles. And then in 2006, uh, with his wife, Leslie Scott, they founded the Oregon Truffle Festival, which is amazing coming together, supporting um, the truffle industry. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Charles and uh, welcome and glad you can help us today. Thank you, Glenn. Um, so I've been at this for 20 years. I've been giving tree school talks for about 20 years too. <laughs> Back in the beginning, it was all just sort of speculation. Um, uh, there were no truffle orchards producing truffles in Oregon. Very few people making any part of their living with truffles from the woods. But over this period of time, um, 
we have now more producing truffle orchards than any other state. And there are many people making a, a portion of their living from harvesting the native Oregon truffle. So it's really a very exciting time. The, it's like the proof of principle is done. And it's a, it feels like it's about to begin to flourish. So that's, that's a, a sketch of my talk. <laughs> You're mute, muted, Glenn. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Do you have a title slide um, after oh, the of course. placeholder here? Just want to. There it is. I just wanted to see that picture, of that truffle. All right. Well, we're going to start off with a poll, um, and I click that up now, and you should see it on your screen. And if you would uh, just take a minute and answer the questions about where you're from. Uh, about yourself, if you're a woodland owner or natural resource professional or other, if you do own land, how many acres? And we also have a question from Charles. Um, are you currently growing or harvesting truffles? So if you go ahead and answer those questions and then I'll review the results and put them up for everyone to see. It usually only takes about a minute. Now tree school start, this particular tree school from Clackamas started out in a Willamette Valley, kind of Northwest Oregon centric, but should point out that tree school online really is becoming more widespread. And so we see folks from the Willamette Valley around Oregon, coastal Oregon, uh, also some from Washington state. And usually when we get to about 80% of the votes, it, we're done, so we'll see. All right, last chance, I'm gonna close the poll. All right, and share the results. So um, almost 70% of us from the Willamette Valley, uh, another 14% from coastal Oregon, central eastern Oregon, just a few, and also from Washington State, a good number. Uh, woodland owners, again, all about over two thirds, um, some private natural resource and public natural resource professionals, uh, and about 23% are other, so not within owners or professionals. As far as acreage, um, again, 10 to 40 acres is over a third, and then kind of uh, about 18% with no land, and uh, another pretty good number when you get up to 40 to 100 acres. Curious to see how many folks are growing or harvesting truffles. Uh, two people say that they're growing or harvesting truffles, so the rest of us know, and we were here to learn. So very good. Hopefully that helps set the stage for you, Charles. Sure, yeah. And uh, go ahead and take it away and I will bow out. Okay. Uh, so the beginning at the beginning, what are truffles? Um, years ago when I started this, uh, started giving tree school talks, I would ask the question, how many of you have ever tasted a truffle? And about 10% of the people in the room said that they had tasted a truffle before. I would guess that if I asked that question now, it'd be close to 90%. <laughs> so uh, I'm, in a couple of years, I may start leaving these slides off, but I just wanted to make sure that people don't think we're talking about chocolate. So truffles are mushrooms that fruit underground, and then they depend on animals to disperse their spores. So that's how... Um, they're distinguished from mushrooms, that they depend on animals. Um, and if you think about it from their perspective, they're underground, and yet they need to disperse their spores. So how do they do that? And they're, they're using animals, they're using us, effectively, to find them and eat them and disperse them. <laughs> uh, truffles have been celebrated for thousands of years. You can read about them from Roman historians. And more recently, very recently actually, uh, three of the val valuable European species have succumbed to domestication. Uh, they include the French black truffle, the burgundy truffle, and the Bianchetto truffle. And the black truffle is by far the most commonly cultivated, and it is now grown all over the world. And essentially, all of those regions of the world where people grow red wine grapes and, uh, and beyond that. And then, of course, um, there are two things that most Americans know about truffles, that they're expensive and that they're harvested with pigs. <laughs> uh, 
I actually found a video of a truffle hunting pig. It was the first time I'd ever seen one. It's, it's all gone to the dogs now. So what's the big deal? Why, why are they so expensive? Um, and it's, it's because they're depending on us to disperse their spores. They really are clever about manipulating us. So they produce these strong aromas that can capture the attention of some passing animal in the woods that's busy doing something else. Um, and these aromas have to be both strong enough to detect when you're not very close to them and with wind and whatever else is going on, but they also have to be compelling enough. And one of the ways they've made themselves compelling is to produce pheromones. Uh, so if you think about where they are, they're underground, the soil is typically wet, it's typically cold, it's in the winter. So how do they get their aroma out of those conditions into the air and then strong enough and compelling enough to manipulate the behavior of the animal that detects it? And pheromones is very clever. You know, these fat soluble compounds that escape, that are very volatile even at low temperatures, escape the soil very easily and uh, are able to manipulate an animal's behavior even at very low concentrations. So on some level, no wonder they're expensive. Truffles want us to eat them. Uh, this photo is from the Alba Truffle Festival in Northern Italy. And down on the bottom right, uh, if you can see the mouse pointer there, the, the prices are in euros and they're uh, per kilogram, but it's 4,800 euros per kilogram, which translates to about $2,700 per pound. Um, and that's really not the highest prices I've ever seen. There was one truffle that auctioned for $330,000 for a three, three pound truffle a few years ago. Um, prices of $3,000 a pound are, are really not uncommon, particularly in a retail setting like this. Uh, so the, uh, an individual truffle like that is hundreds of dollars. So this talk is divided into two parts. The first part will be discussing cultivation of truffles in orchards of inoculated trees planted for that purpose. The second part is about the native Oregon truffles that live naturally under Douglas fir trees, um, really in throughout the entire range of uh, the coastal variety of Douglas fir, so it's from Central California all the way up into British Columbia. But they, because of um, the land use history, they're most abundant in Oregon and Southwest Washington. So, but I'll start with the farming of European truffles. Uh, this is a photo of a hazelnut orchard. And this one happens to be in East Tennessee. It was among the most productive truffle orchards on the planet until, you know, the Eastern filbert light <laughs> killed all of those trees. But um, it uh, produced on the order of 200 pounds of truffles a year on and seven and a half acres. And the dog, the white dog there, who is the grandfather of my truffle dog, was finding a truffle that the next day was sent to the president of the United States. Uh, so it, 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 this was really one of the first proof of concept orchards in the country. And Tom, Tom Michaels, who's on the right with the shovel, actually did his doctorate at Oregon State University in the same program that I did. As many people, who, who are making a difference in the truffle world have they have some part of their training at Oregon State University. So why bother cultivating truffles? And it's because <laughs> over the past century, which rep this, this graph shows, truffle production has gone through what appears to be an exponential decline. And people have looked for all sorts of explanations for this, from acid rain to all sorts of things. But uh, the reality is that over this same period of time, two things happened. One, if you, if you looked at the previous century, it would be a mirror image of this as a result of phylloxera killing off the grapes in Europe and all that farmland went fallow and was, some of it was actually planted with oak trees for the purpose of growing truffles. So by the end of the 19th century, truffle production was an all time high. And then when uh, the grafted grapes came into production and people started replanting the vineyards, well, some of that truffle producing land was converted back to vineyard. The other phenomenon, there's sort of two other phenomena, I guess. 
One is just the depopulation of rural areas. These truffles actually thrive in the human environment. They're in that sense, they're kind of uh, like all of the crops that we grow as foods. They thrive in our in our anthropogenic habitat, our human created habitats. Um, so they're living in the corners of farmland and neglected areas that are being encroached by trees. Um, but in order for those areas to be neglected, they had to first be managed. <laughs> Um, pasture land that trees are encroaching upon. And then finally, uh, one other factor in all of this is readily available electricity in people's homes. So no, people no longer needed to go out into, into the woods to gather so much firewood. Um, if you look at the areas of France that produced the most truffles historically, those areas are now almost completely wooded. I'm thinking in particular the Lot region of France. And what used to be farmland over vast areas is now forest over vast areas. And these truffles live on farmland, on the edges of forest, not in interior forest conditions. So all of these factors combined to create an exponential decline in truffle production. And then of course, over the, over the decades, the price of truffles has risen steadily as well. So the, the case for grow, cultivating truffles was very compelling, it became very compelling. Um, in about in the 1960s and the first inoculated seedlings uh, were produced in the let me see the late 1960s and the first truffles were produced in the early 1970s and between then and now it's spread all over the world wholesale prices and these are these are i'm defining wholesale here as prices that the, a restaurant would pay for truffles so the French black truffle, $600 to $1,100 per pound, depending on the supply and the quality. The Burgundy truffle, $125 to $400 a pound. And the Bianchetto, $250 to $500. These are prices for uh, imported truffles from Europe that are already are often a week old before they reach the, the table. And uh, I don't have real data on this yet, but the Commercial growers in the U.S. who are growing these same truffles are able to charge considerably more for them, even in very local restaurants and food carts and things, places that never bought truffles previously. Uh, so there's, there's clearly a premium on the price for a locally grown truffle. So the way this all works is uh, with inoculated seedlings. This is the technology that made it possible to grow truffles in a controlled way in orchards, and of course, is what made it possible to grow truffles outside of their natural habitat. Uh, so, inoculated seedlings are currently produced by five companies in the U.S. and Canada. I'm guessing that they plant about 200 acres annually, and I'm also guessing that it, about 3,000 acres are planted per year globally. Uh, and actually, quite a while ago, probably 20 years ago, uh, the the French Federation of Truffle Cultures said that, at least in France, 90% of the black truffles were now being grown on farms. That was 20 years ago. This, uh, it, between then and now, the same is true in both Italy and Spain, where the bulk of black truffle production is, is now taking place on farms. Uh, and I realized after making these slides that um, so the, the, slide, the trees in this photo are a live oak variety that's actually frost hardy and can live in the Willamette Valley. But we can work with a lot of different kinds of trees and we're working with a lot of native trees like the, the, the Oregon white oaks, the black oaks that live in Southern Oregon, uh, a lot of different California native trees. We're experimenting with things like aspens and cottonwoods and various willows, our native, our native hazelnuts. So there's a, uh, one, one of the things that makes this talk appropriate for tree school is the fact that uh, while these are orchards that are irrigated and managed for weeds and, and in that sense might be more like a fruit orchard, these are actually um, trees that will, as they mature, produce many of the ecosystem services of a natural forest. So they're kind of doing both things, producing a commercial crop and doing all the good things for the world that trees do. Uh, after inoculating the tree, the goal is to produce ectomycorrhizae. This is the symbiotic association between the fungus and the tree's roots. And uh, you can think what you're seeing here is entirely fungal. 
So this fungus is completely covering the fine roots of the tree and penetrating between the, the epidermal cells of the plant. And the purpose of this is this association. It's a mutually beneficial association that both partners need. The fungus is able to send out its very fine hyphae into the soil and uh, more effectively explore the soil and retrieve nutrients. The tree is producing food through photosynthesis that it shares with the fungus. And, and of course, the fungus is sharing all those nutrients with the tree. So it's a mutually beneficial and necessary association for the two. The purpose of inoculating the tree is to make sure the fungus, is, the fungus you want is there first. Because once it has sort of captured this resource, it gains a competitive advantage that it manages to keep for decades. It'll, it, it, typically, I, I can think of very few cases where a, a seedling that was well colonized by truffle mycorrhizae gets sent out into the world and I receive samples back um, where the, the truffle has disappeared. It just simply, it seems to be a very rare occurrence. And when, when the truffle has disappeared, it's because some other truffle species has outcompeted it. And that, I, I can only think of two cases where that has happened. So these inoculated seedlings are planted into orchards. These are hazelnuts in the Willamette Valley. And you can notice a, uh, so the history of this particular stand of trees, there was an herbicide strip down each row of trees and then the, the plants started to grow back. But you can see there's a bare patch under every tree. That's actually the fungus killing the weeds around the tree uh, in order to access all of the nutrients that the weeds would otherwise get. Uh, that's my speculation, but um, so you can see that the fungus is well established on all of these trees because of the bare patch that's referred to as a brulee. This is an orchard in East Tennessee, also hazelnuts. This particular orchard, the only reason I'm showing it is because it's only 50 trees planted at a density of 500 trees per acre. So this is one tenth of an acre. And this orchard produced 30 pounds of the black truffles every year that sell for prices on the order of $1,000 per pound. So this, this grower with a one tenth acre orchard um, was for a number of years making enough money to buy a new car each year. Uh, unfortunately, those of you who know the Eastern filbert blight can see that these trees are, are under attack. So the, the only reason that right now there aren't a lot of producing truffle orchards on the East Coast is because of the Eastern filbert blight. Uh, and here on the West Coast, we have fewer strains of the blight and we have blight resistant cultivars of the hazelnut trees. And also we've started emphasizing more oaks. So uh, it's unfortunate that this orchard is now gone, but it, it also helps to prove the concept that this could be a commercially viable enterprise. So this is where the producing orchards are in the country. Uh, you, you can see concentrations in the eastern states and on the west coast. Um, uh, there's an orchard in Mendocino County, California. It was the very first orchard that produced any of the European truffles outside of their natural habitat. It proved the concept that they could be grown outside of Europe. That was in 1985. And it took a long time. It just, when I started working this up at 2000, there were only a couple of producing truffle orchards in the country. And since that time, uh, we have eight in Oregon, which is more than any other state that I'm aware of anyway, uh, four in British Columbia, one in Washington, four in Idaho, I think it's seven in California, one anomalous one in Texas, because you know, the, the climate here is so much warmer than any place in Europe that it's a mystery how this European trouble could live there. Uh, one of my customers in Arkansas, couple in Tennessee. This is as of January 2020, and since this time I've learned of two other orchards, one in Tennessee and uh, one in New York that have begun production of truffles. The New York is a burgundy truffle that can tolerate colder winters. We have a couple of native species, this tuber leonia in South Georgia, one of my customers there. That's known as the pecan truffle, lives in pecan orchards, and this tuber caniliculatum, uh, known as the Appalachian truffle in one orchard in Quebec.
And hopefully soon we'll have more colored dots and shapes indicating the Oregon truffles. So the key points for cultivation of European truffles is are that one, orchards are producing truffles in diverse climates and soils across the continent. Really, when you look at that uh, distribution of orchards, there isn't a lot in common among them. The soils are all very different. The climates are very different from Vancouver Island to East Tennessee uh, and Texas. <laughs> The one thing that is common among all the orchards that are producing truffles is that they are well managed. Um, but what does well managed mean? It, uh, it means managing uh, pests, irrigation, and weeds, which are all different in different places. Uh, the other key point, North American soils, climates, pests, and competitive pressures are all different than in Europe, requiring us to develop our own methodologies and conduct our own research. There's this tendency for people to do things exactly the way they're done in Europe, which works in Europe, but <laughs> isn't necessarily the right solution here. There really isn't, and then the next key point, each orchard is different, it must be managed differently. This is just farming. Uh, each, there are different challenges in different situations, and the farmer's job is to adapt their methods to the challenges that they face. Um, so, and then also back to the previous point, North American soils are different. In nearly every situation, we have to add lime to our soils to raise the soil pH where in their natural habitat in Europe, uh, they don't need to do that. And that, that changes soil biology. It really creates a lot of issues, one of which is that it creates an island of habitat where the native fungi are at a competitive disadvantage, So, which is interesting. It, it suggests the possibility that truffle farming could be more successful here than it is in its natural habitat. And then finally, the truffle farming works. It's, it's working. People are growing truffles. There are about approaching 30 commercially productive truffle farms in the United States right now. So site selection. Truff, truffles live, they, they live in naturally in their natural habitat on trees that are encroaching on grassland. So to cultivate them, uh, it's th that fact suggests to me that they're, they're looking for a grassland soil ecology as opposed to a woodland soil ecology. So typically we start with bare land that hasn't had trees on it for some time and doesn't and lacks sort of residual woody material. The soils need to be well drained and I would add they need to be well structured and well aerated um, and that's throughout the soil profile not just on the surface. The warm aspect I suppose I'm talking specifically of the black truffles here often they're on hilltops on south facing slopes and um, the, for, the heat is necessary for them to, to, for the truffles to produce their fruit. They actually, uh, sunlight hitting the soil triggers their fruiting. But also in the winter, uh, you don't want to be in a place where cold air drains because the truffles are in the ground in the winter and if the soil freezes, they will also freeze and be damaged. Truffle farming is, uh, it's a water intensive crop. So you need irrigation water. And uh, that's, a, that's a conundrum, because often, here in Oregon anyway, some of our red soils, the Jory soil, Nekia, Belpine, those, those are great soils for the European truffles, but there's almost never any irrigation water associated with them. So just because of that fact, the best places for growing truffles are on established farmland. And then, of course, access for farm equipment. The, the volumes of lime that need to be applied are enormous. It's about a semi truck load per acre. And uh, so you need to be able to get at least dump truck sized machinery onto the site. Basic site preparation, preparation steps uh, mow, <laughs> level the site to clear obstacles as necessary, apply lime, uh, kind of break open the sod, incorporate the soil amendments. Mark the planting spots, install ir the irrigation system. So you, the, the planting spots inform the design of the irrigation system. And then begin the weed control before the trees are even planted. And eventually in the winter time, you plant the inoculated seedlings. And then if necessary, install tree protectors. So it's really it's straightforward. There's no mystery here. Uh, there are a lot of people out there, because this is all so new, uh, a lot of people would like you to believe that you can only succeed if you buy their secret sauce. <laughs> it's all complete nonsense, in my opinion. Uh, so lime. 
nearly every orchard needs lime. The, for the black truffles, the target pH we're looking for, well, I should say the ballpark is between 7.5 and 8.3. At least that's what's in the European literature. And nearly all of the literature is European. In fact, the orchards that are producing in this country are, uh, have soil pH uh, as low as 6.5. So I used to recommend a soil pH of 7.9, but I've backed off from that. The trees are happier, uh, things develop more quickly, less stress, uh, fewer problems at a pH of 7.5. And, and of course, it requires considerably less lime. You get diminishing returns as you apply more lime. So to get from 7.5 to 7.9 requires more lime than it took to get to 7.5, like a lot more lime. <laughs> um, so still, even at that lower target, 30 tons per acre is, is what I generally recommend. And then the type of limes, calcium carbonate, not dolomite or calcium. <laughs> Uh, hydroxide, any of those other more, more potent thing, things. So uh, calcium carbonate lime or ag lime, uh, unless you have a magnesium deficiency, in which case some dolomite to correct that deficiency is helpful, but the rest of it is done with ag lime. And then uh, the quality of the lime, how finely it's ground influences how effectively it changes the soil pH. Uh, the, Top is, the photo on the top is uh, applying vast amounts of lime. Uh, and the photo at the bottom is actually a soil titration with calcium hydroxide. It's the best way I've found to try to uh, estimate in advance how much lime a particular soil is going to require. You know, your, your soil testing lab will not be able to tell you how much lime is going to be required to reach pH of 7.5. And then of course, finally, planting, which is just like planting any other tree and often some kind of protector is helpful. Managing a truffle orchard is very much like managing any other orchard. You're controlling weeds, you're maintaining the, you're managing the canopy of the tree. Uh, in this case, the truffles themselves required irrigation. The trees obviously, like these are hazelnuts here, they obviously don't need irrigation in the Willamette Valley or on the west side of the Cascades, but the truffles do. In our, our climate, we receive less precipitation in the summer than the more continental climates in the south of France and Spain and Italy. Uh, so irrigation is absolutely essential in our climate. And then, like other orchards or other crops, fertilizers, organic matter, lime, and pest control. So I'll, I'll just kind of go through these in a little tiny bit more detail. So there are various ways of controlling weeds. Uh, in this particular orchard in the south of France, they're just controlling weeds mechanically. There are no chemicals involved. They're just harrowed in both directions. You notice how open this orchard is. This is typical for a black truffle orchard where the, the truffles themselves need sunlight on the soil to drive diurnal temperature fluctuations that somehow serve to trigger the fruiting of the truffle. And then of course, also this, this particular orchard is not irrigated. So um, minimizing the number of plants there is a way to conserve water. This is an orchard in Southern Idaho. They've used glyphosate along the rows and then used rotary herring between the rows. So this is very aggressive weed control. Uh, and you can see it's <laughs> very effective. Uh, and I should mention, all of these orchards are producing truffles. Here's an orchard near Cottage Grove, Oregon. Here, they've, they're not working the soil at all, not touching the soil, at least they weren't at this point. Uh, they're using glufosinate ammonium to control the grass and then also quite a bit of hand weeding. Now, this is a meticulously managed orchard that has produced truffles like clockwork. Each, each phase of the orchard produced its first truffles in year five. And it's gone on to become uh, one of the best orchards in the country right now. And then there's propane torches. <laughs> this, is, this is an interesting weed control method that actually really does work. So this is a tractor attachment sold by Red Dragon. Uh, the tractor ran out of fuel right there. <laughs> so uh, that's why it stopped. But you can see how effective that was. And you can also see that he's not, man he's not protecting the tree or the irrigation system from the flame. Both seem to be unharmed by it. 
And this is what it looks like at night. <laughs> As he says it in his talks, this is a boy toy. Um, this is this is an interesting uh, approach for those people who don't want to use either chemicals. Or, and in many cases, in our uh, Pacific Northwest climate, the soils are still too wet to use mechanical weed control during the window of the year when you can do that, which is typically the month of April. So in most of our soils, it's still too wet to harrow the way other people can. Ah, uh, the brulee. So once uh, the tree becomes well established, I, I sh showed this in a previous photo, the truffle itself takes over some of the weed control. So here's another field that was that all the competing vegetation was sprayed with glyphosate. And when the vegetation grew back, it left these bare patches around every single tree in the orchard. And uh, so uh, effective weed control early in the life of the orchard actually reduces your work in the long term because it speeds up development of the brulee, which does a lot of the work for you. The brulee is also an indication that the orchard's about to produce truffles. And sure enough, uh, this orchard produced its first truffles two years after I took this photo. Irrigation. So there are kind of two phases of irrigation. One is the establishment phase where the objective is to create a superficial root system. You're trying to get the roots to develop near the soil surface where they can produce truffles. The lime is, is it's a rock. It's immobile. It's insoluble. Uh, so it doesn't leach downward through the soil profile very quickly. Uh, it, it may take decades, in fact. Uh, so the only place where truffles can develop is in the very surface layer of soil, the top six or eight inches. So you want the roots to be there, where if you drip irrigate or uh, don't irrigate at all, the roots will tend to grow deeper looking for water, or chasing the water, and then only later as the tree ages will it flip, uh, grow some more superficial root systems that can start to produce truffles. So in those unirrigated, sort of unmanaged orchards in the south of France, it often takes 15 years to get the first truffles, where our objective is to get truffles in about five years. So the irrigation is essential for that. And then during the uh, production phase, say year five and beyond, uh, the irrigation serves to uh, keep the truffle primordia alive through the summer. Because it was, if, if uh, let's say there's a rainstorm or you irrigate, primordia develop, but then the soil dries out again, you can lose your crop. So the irrigation helps the primordia farm and helps to keep them alive through the rest of the dry season. And pest control. So the pests are different everywhere. Here on the west side, our two main pests are gophers, which are not ubiquitous. And <laughs> the photo on the right is uh, a grower near Corvallis actually my very first customer and he sent me a series of these photos when he was first harvesting truffles they were you know just so triumphant <laughs> but in every photo if you look through the calipers there in the bottom of the hole you see slug eggs <laughs> slugs are a very effective predator of truffle primordia and here in the Willamette Valley <coughs> this slug control is absolutely essential to, to get a reliable crop and of course the uh, larger slugs actually get into the truffles themselves. So he has some good photos of slugs crawling out of his truffles. So th those are the two main pests here. Another might be powdery mildew. Uh, other places you go in the country, the pests are different. But regardless of what they are, you have to deal with them. Uh, for example, gophers, it's not so much that they eat the truffles, it's that they browse the roots of the tree itself and stress the tree and uh, deprive the tree of the energy that it needs to feed its mycorrhizal fungi. So it, the gophers can prevent your orchard from ever producing truffles at all. And we've seen this repeatedly. The gophers on some level are, are kind of the most serious threat in the Western states. Uh, and the Eastern states, there are no gophers. So they don't have to worry about that problem. And here's what gophers can do to trees. <laughs> just the tree just falls over in the ground. Oh, I, you wouldn't believe how many orchards that people spent so much money putting in these orchards and then this happens. And finally, truffle dogs. So this, the harvesting of truffles requires an animal. Historically, it was done with pigs in Europe. 
in the last couple of centuries, it's almost entirely done with dogs. And there's, there's really no better way. The, you can get uh, a machine to recognize the smell of truffles, and you can find truffles that way. But the dogs can find truffles from 100 feet away. They can, you know, they can triangulate. They weave back and forth, and they figure out where the truffle is. It's almost like they can see it. It's, it's really a phenomenon to see a dog track down a truffle, truffle from a long, long ways away. Any breed can be trained. Uh, we do a truffle dog competition at the Oregon Truffle Festival called the Jorian. And uh, this picture you see here is of my dog, Mocha, with Dante in the background. Uh, they're like, that breed is Legato Romagnolos. They're the only breed that's been bred for truffle hunting. But so far, we've not had a Legato win the Joriad competition. We've had uh, a couple of labs, a couple of shepherds, and a chihuahua. <laughs> so any, any breed can do it, but not every individual of any breed is good at it. There are certainly Legatos that are unable to find truffles. The training process can be very simple. I, would, I had never trained a dog before I trained Dante. It took me minutes in my yard to get him to learn the trick to find a Q-tip with truffle oil scent on it, really minutes. Uh, and he was on his own doing it by the end of the first training session. I did that just four times in the yard, then took him into the field. It was his first time in the woods. He found a truffle right off the bat. He was just on it. It can be that easy. We In our truffle dog training seminar at the festival, um, this year, every single dog found their first truffles in the wild uh, after the, during the second day of the event. And always a large proportion of the dogs do. So it can be easy, but dogs present diff idiosyncrasies. So it's <laughs> often helpful to get professional dog trainers to help you deal with those idiosyncrasies. So the truffle dogs are expensive, um, but they can pay for themselves very, very quickly. So the timeline in a well-managed orchard, and I, I add the, the term well-managed because in poorly managed orchards, the timeline is very different. If you neglect the weeds or the pests, it takes a lot longer to get truffles. The truffle fungus doesn't disappear, it just doesn't fruit. So it's unforgiving in that sense. Um, and, and that's probably the, the thing that is hardest about truffle farming is that you don't just get a poor crop, you get no crop if, if you're doing something wrong. But there's no mystery, it's just farming. Uh, so the typical harvest, we, we want to see the first truffles in five years, but five to seven years is pretty common in well-managed orchards. Uh, full production in 10 to 12 years is, is normal in well-managed orchards. And then the duration of harvest, uh, in Europe, it depends on the species of trees. So with hazelnuts, it may only be 20 years or 25 years. Or with oaks, it can be hundreds of years. Um, but it's not clear that the same phenomenon will occur here where we don't have the natural competition of the truffles. It may be that the truffles maintain the competitive advantage for decades longer. And I was actually in Sweden a year and a half ago hunting burgundy truffles under hazelnuts that were estimated to be a thousand years old. So it may be possible to harvest truffles for a very long time. Um, yields, the observed range is zero, those orchards that can fail completely, to the best orchard on the planet that anyone is talking about. It's producing on the order of 500 pounds per acre per year. Uh, a typical range, with the typical yield, I guess I should say the only kind of academically defensible yield estimate that's published is about 35 pounds per acre. And I would bracket that with 20 to 50 pounds per acre per year as a typical result. There are a lot of orchards that produce more than 100 pounds per year. But for business planning purposes, you don't want to be too optimistic. This is a orchard in the south of France using all holly oaks, Quercus elex. Uh, and this is showing the on the x-axis percent of trees and the y-axis the year of production. Uh, so it took uh, nine years to get the first truffle. By year 10, 10% 10 of the trees are produ in production. So this top line is the percent of trees that are produced to date. The middle line is the percent of trees that produced in that particular year. And the bottom line is the percent of trees that began production in that year. So this graph says a few things. Um, one, 
over the course of from 1986 to 1994, they they cut almost 70% of the trees into production, which is remarkable. Uh, in a good orchard, 50% of the trees are producing truffles. So this is a very good orchard. Uh, but it's clear from the second line, not every tree produces every year. And the third line says that even though we've got 70% of the trees in production, we're still getting 10% more to begin production each year. So the tra trajectory is heading toward 100% of the trees in production. But the time frame is daunting here. Uh, so this is year nine. Uh, <laughs> I think it goes through year 17 or something like that. And it's still increasing in production. Uh, so this is a, a normal trajectory. We want to speed this up, which and it's this this uh, time frame suggests to me that this was an orchard that was managed in a kind of uh, uh, hands-off way, where they weren't controlling weeds and were not irrigating. They were just letting nature take its course, and it takes a long time, but it can be very effective. And that might actually be a good strategy in the sense that the weed management and pest management, irrigation, they're all very expensive. And to not have to do them and still get a crop just seems appealing. So this is a graph from our uh, Oregon Culinary Truffles Feasibility Study that you can find online. And uh, there's a link in the handout and uh, at the end of this talk uh, showing cash flow. Uh, in a ideal or a hypothetical five acre truffle orchard in the Willamette Valley. So like, like so many businesses, first year you sink a lot of money into it. Uh, but then the out of pocket expense each year thereafter is, is not so great. And in fact, it, we're assuming it begins production in year five and year six, there, the, the orchard produces enough truffles to generate positive cash flow. Um, so there's no, there's no longer any out of pocket expense beyond this point. And, uh, you recoup your out of pocket expense at about, what is it? Your eight and a half. This bottom line is represents the op the out of pocket expense and the opportunity cost. So that say the money you didn't make the 8% you didn't make or whatever, because you didn't put it in the stock market, something like that. Uh, and, even this number is 8%. We use that as our uh, opportunity cost. And you recoup that at this point at year 10 in this scenario, using a, a full production yield of 35 pounds per acre. Uh, we're assuming it's a little premium on the price. They're assuming at the price of $1,000 per pound because the truffles are local. And I think that's well supported. Um, so it, Takes a long time to get there, but beyond this point, these this, these trajectories, these numbers look very very positive. Um, in this, the kind of like the average annual return in, on investment over a twenty year period is something like thirty six percent. It just takes a long time to get there. <laughs> uh, and here's a table showing challenging our yield, our price assumption, and our yield assumption. Uh, so this is the scenario where you're not taking the opportunity cost into account. And even at the lowest price and the lowest yield, the number is still positive. You're still making money. Where if you look at the same graph for Pinot Noir grapes in the Willamette Valley, it's very, very different where uh, the only number that's positive is the highest yield, highest production scenario. Uh, if, you take the if you do take the opportunity cost into account, uh, the lowest yield, lowest price number doesn't get you the 8%, but every other scenario does. This looks too good to be true on some level. Uh, what it doesn't take into account is risk, which is hard to, hard to quantify. Um, but the one encouraging thing in that respect is that the well-managed orchards go on to, you know, all, nearly all of them go on to produce truffles. So it suggests that, that, that most of the risk is kind of under the control of the farmer. So that's the end of part one. And uh, it looks like some questions came in. And I'm happy to field those now before going on to the discussion of Oregon truffles. All right. Very good. So we do have quite a few questions. And I'm going to go ahead and get started with those, Charles. This is okay. 
fascinating. Okay. Um, first off, uh, there's damage potential of uh, other animals. So you mentioned gophers. How about voles, moles, squirrels, coyotes? Um, really, is that an issue that needs requires attention? Yeah, there are a lot of other animals that can cause problems. Uh, the only one on your list that I would say is not a problem is moles. Uh, the coyotes are smart and they know that irrigation pipes have water in them. <laughs> uh, bulls definitely stress can browse the roots of the trees and they will eat truffles. All rodents will eat truffles, mice. Um, and for each of them, you know, there, of course, deer and elk are a problem. Skunks and raccoons will eat truffles. Bears will eat truffles. Deer will eat truffles. <laughs> Nearly everything except uh, those things that are strictly carnivores will eat truffles. Um, that's generally not that big of a deal, though. Uh, we don't see sort of predation of truffles as a big issue. It, the, the animals I worry about are the ones that stress the trees. So elk can be particularly difficult with young trees, for example. Right. Okay. Um, so here a person actually has a farm that you helped inoculate six years ago. And uh, I think at this point, it's, they went through some hard times and, and not sure, you know, the status of it, uh, probably weren't able to manage it too intensively. So what do you do now? What do they do now um, uh, to, <laughs> to check on the potential, you know, what's out there? Uh, do they go out with dogs and see, you know, if it's established yet? And what's, what do you, what advice do you have? Okay. So yeah, uh, it is possible to check root samples just to reassure themselves that the truffle fungus is still in the soil. But I've, I've looked at enough root samples to know that the truffle fungus is still there. Um, I would say, and actually right now, this time of year is critical to make sure the weeds are under control, you're getting enough water, and the trees are not being stressed by pests or nutrient problems. Um, and it may still be possible to get a crop this coming winter if if those things are brought under control but i would say yeah the, uh, uh at least when i supply trees i well i don't charge any extra fees for people to ask questions and they should be in touch with me very good good advice um about trimming trees um uh, been told that trees should be trimmed to one trunk um also, just the maintenance, working hard to mow and spray all the grass, but seeing pictures, do you have to really be that intensive? Um, and questions about suckers. So there's a few things, pruning, sure. trimming, how intense the weed control needs to be. Hand trimming 4,000 trees just seems to be a huge effort. Um, can you just keep the grass low? Some things like that, you know, what, how much is enough? Oh, okay, yeah, really good questions. So with hazelnuts as the host tree, typically when you're growing them for nut production, you trim the tree to a single trunk. For truffles, they just behave differently in the, the high pH environment. And uh, you get this problem where the trunks will sort of senesce. They'll get old and lose vigor, stop growing. So it's really essential to allow some of the suckers to grow uh, and maintain multiple stems. It's the, it's the best way to maintain vigor in the tree. And I suspect that has a lot to do with the soil pH. Uh, so most truffle orchards allow multiple stems on the trees. Uh, of course, if they're oaks, then it's just one stem. So that's one question. I think that addressed suckers and, okay, hand pruning. There's no question, hand pruning 4,000 hazelnuts is too much work. and I think it can be done mechanically. In fact, I'm, I'm beginning work on my own truffle farm and I have no intention of pruning trees by hand. Uh, it will be done with a tractor attachment. Uh, uh, let me see. Oh, how much is enough with regard to the weed control? You know, it may be, that's a difficult question because we see some anomalies. There's one orchard in California um, owned by Jackson Family Wines that is producing great quantities of truffles and their weed control is not as meticulous as you, in some of the photos you see in my talk here. And I suspect what they're doing right is they're controlling weeds at the right time of year when it makes a difference and then letting the weeds grow back at the time of year when it doesn't make a difference. And that time of year when it does make a difference is in the spring. That's the period where the tree is going through much more active root growth and the mycorrhizae themselves are 
are growing most vigorously. And so that's the time of year when competition from competing vegetation would make the biggest difference. Um, that's just speculation. It's, it's an interesting observation though that here's this orchard that does, doesn't appear to be meticulously managed that's actually producing tremendous volumes of truffles. Um, but uh, as generally speaking, it's not that the weeds prevent truffles from fruiting, it's, it, it, it just slows down the development of the orchard. Um, so it may be possible to get truffles with very little weed management if you're willing to wait longer. If you want truffles in five years, it's fairly clear that the weed management needs to be uh, aggressive. Uh, one orchard, one of our customers in Kentucky just has set their flail mower so low that it, they're basically kind of scarring up the surface of the soil, uh, but they're not using any chemicals. They're not harrowing any of that. They're just mowing. So hopefully that answers that question. <laughs> yeah, well, that covered a lot of bases, but that's yeah. always the balance. Well, and speaking of weed control, so what about the effects of chemicals, the fertilizers and the pesticides? I mean, what's the balance? Are there uh, concerns about um, damage uh, yeah. or toxicity? Uh, there are concerns. In fact, I believe in Australia, orchards are tested, their truffles are tested for pesticide or herbicide res residues. Uh, and certainly there are herbicides that are approved that are, that will accumulate in, in the truffle. Um, so there, and, and also the high end restaurants that are buying these truffles want organic produce. So there's, there's, um, there's some incentive to try to produce truffles organically. And I think there are good ways of doing that. It's not necessary to use chemicals. Um, there isn't, I don't, I have not, there's a tiny bit of literature looking at the effects of different herbicides on the development of the truffle mycorrhizae. And I have not seen evidence that the chemicals themselves are harming the truffle directly. Um, but that's a question that comes up a lot. And actually I'll be testing clove oil, which is an organic herbicide uh, on its effects on the truffle fungus this year in the nursery. Uh, so yeah, this is a persistent question. But the chemicals are not necessary. It, it just if you're using something like flame weeding, you have to be on top of it. The flame is only effective when the plants are small. If you let them get away from you, then you've got to do something else. Um, and then on the East Coast, where the weeds never stop growing, uh, it becomes more difficult to farm organically. But our weeds here on the West Coast, a lot of them are kind of done by June or July. <laughs> okay. Um well, the other chemical, of course, is the lime, uh, the fertilizer, ah, sure. um, which is a different story. And does that have to be on a yearly or, you know, what's the way to um, do it often enough? I think the best approach is to apply all of it at once before the trees are planted so that you can mix it into the soil without harming the trees. And then supplementing as necessary, just with annual testing. But so far, practically no one who applied enough lime to begin with has had to supplement it. So it's, um, it of course depends on the soil, how much clay and organic matter is in the soil. If there's very little clay and organic matter, then the lime will tend to leach out more quickly. Uh, but most people see very little change over a period of say 10 years. So it's just a point of testing your soil and knowing what's right and getting it at the beginning uh, to establish the crop yeah. at the right pH. There is, um, uh, although, just back to the previous question, when you apply that much lime and cause that radical a change of soil pH so suddenly, it does upset the biological community in the soil. And we see evidence of an interruption in nutrient cycling as a result. So uh, there's uh, some argument there for a, a more gradual approach to the pH change, you know, incrementally increasing it. The trouble is, how do you incorporate the lime once the trees are already there? Okay, very good. Um, another question, uh, relationship between the age of the orchard uh, and productivity or effectiveness for truffles? Age of the orchard and productivity? Um, I guess I don't understand that often they start to produce at year five, reach something like full production in year 10. Uh, yeah, I think you kind of answered that with your general yeah. um, graphs that you were showing. Okay, um, well, here's just a general question, you know, random trees turning yellow, um, 
finding different information, how do you go about diagnosing uh, problems with your, your hazelnut trees? Uh, there, so I mentioned the nutrient cycling, inter, the interruption of nutrient cycling that appears to happen after heavy lime. So during the first four or five years of the orchard, we see a complex of symptoms. Uh, things like sunburn and micronutrient deficiencies, which are pretty recognizable as uh, sort of green veins, but then yellowing of the rest of the leaf. Uh, you know, we see a bunch of these things together. Uh, it, it's hard to diagnose exactly what nutrient is missing. It may be molybdenum that's somehow necessary in whatever enzymes are processing nitrogen. <laughs> so it looks like a nitrogen deficiency when it's caused by something else. Um, there is a simple solution, though, which is just a, uh, a micronutrient blend applied as a foliar spray. My preference is uh, amino acid chelated micronutrients, um, although some people are using fulvic acid chelating micronutrients. And it seems to turn the tree around very quickly to produce a much better color within just a couple of weeks. All right. Um... You had some data on costs. So, what's kind of typical costs for establishing? Uh, oh, good orchards? question. I suppose that represents a missing slide. <laughs> uh, so, if in our Oregon Culinary Truffles Feasibility Study, we have a production budget. And uh, that study was published in 2009, so it, it requires some updating. But at that time, the estimate was about $12,000 per acre, which included the trees, uh, the soil amendments, the irrigation system, and the labor. Those were the major components of the cost. I would update that to about $15,000 per acre. And that's, um, there are a lot of factors that can influence the cost, like the quality of irrigation system that you install. And then also many sites require, say if you have elk, you may need a fence or you may need to drill a new well, develop a, build a pond. Those things we're not including, or build a road. So yep. I think just in terms of planting an orchard, a fifteen thousand dollars per acre is a is a ballpark cost. You also had the maintenance or the cash flow numbers, and that seemed right. pretty high as far as uh, maintaining. Yeah, there that same budget estimates a annual cost of about $2,500 per acre per year to maintain a truffle orchard. And that's the weed control, uh, maintaining the irrigation system, <clears throat> the pest control, and then also the harvesting, which is out walking your dog once a week through the three month harvest season. Okay. Um, how about re-inoculating? <laughs> uh, and the cost and labor and potential success. <laughs> Yeah, I, so this is obviously somebody who's been paying attention to what's going on in our industry. And there are, uh, there is some good literature showing that you can boost truffle production by, uh, there's this technique called Spanish well, where you dig a hole, fill it with an artificial substrate like perlite and peat moss, add truffle spores to that. And over the course of a couple of years, the tree roots grow into that very loose, fluffy, well aerated substrate that's filled with truffle spores, and you get this this very intense truffle production in that well. Um, the problem is, of course, once as soon as as soon as one of those truffles ripens and the dog alerts on it, you end up dug, digging them all up. So the one truffle is ripe, and all the rest are immature. And the chefs are the chefs are aware of this problem, and they don't they're starting to. Uh, object to the Spanish well approach. So okay. more recently, people are broadcasting spores. I, I don't know why this, this term re-inoculation, the, the, um, the truffle fungus is still there. The purpose of the spores being added is to provide a mating partner because the truffle is fruit in response to a mating event. And uh, there are different strains that function as male and female. The thing is, None of it's necessary. The, our first orchard that began production in Oregon, uh, near Corvallis, no, we didn't add any more spores to that orchard. Uh, so it's clear that the truffle doesn't need have more spores to be added. I, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent about this approach because uh, 
when you're adding truffle spores, what you're adding is actual truffles that are very expensive. And we've had a number of people do this so far with no results. There's no return on this investment. I'm not convinced yet that it's the magic bullet solution that everyone wants it to be. Okay. Uh, a question actually that was emailed in, I don't know if the, they're on board here. Uh, so question was, you've already mentioned that irrigation is really important, but particularly here in the West, uh, the drought. Um, so it sounds like irrigation to get truffles through the drought is going to be really essential. Um, you know, and how do they survive if you miss it, if they have to go through a drought? What are so the, the impacts? There are just a few papers on the, the effects of soil moisture on truffle production. And it's clear that once soil moisture falls below a threshold in one of the papers, it was negative one kilopascals. Once the most soil moisture falls below that threshold, you start to see decreased truffle production. Uh, so yes, drought can affect uh, truffles. And it's actually thought with climate change that uh, it's the drought rather than the heat that's going to most impact truffle production over time. And uh, some evidence for that is the fact that um, this past year, there was a year ago, there was record heat in Southern Europe, but we also had record truffle production, suggesting that as people have invested in more irrigation systems, they've overcome the change in the climate. Okay. Um, one last question about orchards, I guess, is uh, driving tractors between rows and during spring and summer, um, you know, where are the roots? Uh, do you have to worry about putting heavy weight um, you know, outside or, or within the rooting zone of the trees, you know, some yeah. tips Excellent about. question. And it's absolutely true. Um, driving a tractor through the orchard, even once, will cause compaction in the ruts of the tractor. And compaction is the enemy of truffle production. Um, I said in the site selection slide that uh, you need a well-structured, well-aerated soil. Tractors are the enemy of that. <laughs> So I would say um, you, you do need to drive tractors through. Uh, you want to avoid really wet soil, but you also want to stay in the same ruts all the time so that you're not uh, compacting any more in an area than necessary. So you're, you are kind of sacrificing those ruts for the purpose of producing truffles. In fact, there are some systems, truffle production systems, that you don't even irrigate between the rows of trees. It, you just sort of don't plan to produce truffles there. You irrigate uh, in a narrow strip uh, and use the irrigation to manipulate root growth to focus it in that area where you never drive a tractor. In fact, so just drive it between rows and kind of keep the roots separate from the tractor row. Yeah, exactly. And further, I mean, it's actually a, a not a good idea to walk in the orchard too much. You want to maintain very loose, fluffy conditions. And I'm often asked, can we graze livestock in the truffle orchard? And I would say, yes, you can, but it's probably not a good idea. All right. And if you do, you want to do it during a dry time of year and really minimize it. Well, I think we ought to get on to the next part. Um, okay. We've got about, uh, oh, 15 minutes left if you want to leave time for questions at the end. Um, okay. So go ahead and I'll turn off the Q&A for now and back to your presentation. Okay. <laughs> So the other cool thing that's happening in Oregon and has been happening for since about the mid 1970s is the discovery of our own native culinary truffles. Uh, and at this point, they're not being farmed. So what I'm going to be talking about here is the potential for farming these species and some of the work we've done to help promote that and some of the evidence that suggests that it could, could really work. So these photos are a famous Christmas tree orchard that was near somewhere near Lebanon, Oregon, in the Willamette Valley. And the story, as I understand it, was that this farmer who was harvesting his trees, these are eight-year-old Christmas trees, harvesting the trees, presumably in November, finds these lumps of fungus, takes them to the extension service, kind of with the idea of well, what's killing my trees now. And they direct him to the forest um, the forest mycology lab, Jim Trappy, who says, we've got to get out there and see this. Uh, and, and they got this great photo of these enormous truffles. Those are among some of the largest white truffles I've ever seen fruiting under a Christmas tree. So this is clearly 
not a natural situation. This is a human created uh, situation and the truffles are thriving in it, which just in itself suggests we can grow these things. And uh, so I'll just be talking about how that might be possible. So the key points for Oregon truffles, the Oregon truffles living under Douglas fir trees is um, that they're common, widespread and abundant. They're everywhere. It essentially, if you look at the hills around the Willamette Valley, if they're Douglas fir, there's a really good chance that there are at least some Oregon truffles. Uh, and when I say Oregon truffles, I'm thinking of four species in particular, the winter white, the spring white, the black and the brown truffles. Um, I'll only be talking about the winter white and the black right now because those are the, the two that are actually sold in any volume. Um, but they're, they're everywhere. And under the right set of conditions that are not difficult to create, you can actually get very abundant production. Second is that Oregon truffles uh, perform well in taste tests in comparison with their more famous European species. Um, and their prices are beginning to reflect that fact. That second key point was actually one of the reasons that we started the Oregon Truffle Festival. Because uh, <laughs> I was in this interesting position of making my living from the European truffles, but harvesting native Oregon truffles sort of recreationally or uh, to trade to restaurants, whatnot. And in my own refrigerator, I would have these famous expensive European truffles next to their humble, inexpensive Oregon truffles. And when we opened the fridge, the truffles we could actually smell were the Oregon truffles. And it was very clear that part of the reputation at the time, years ago, was that Oregon truffles were weak or unreliable. But in, our, in my experience and my wife's, <laughs> uh, the Oregon truffles are powerful. They're easily as powerful as any truffles on the planet. And so the problem, it became clear, was was not the truffles themselves, but how they were being harvested. Uh, the researchers who discovered them in the first place were using rakes, which is indiscriminate. It gets truffles that are not yet ripe. A truffle is like a fruit in the sense that it needs to be ripe to have its culinary value. And people were harvesting them unripe. So naturally, they didn't, yeah, the chefs didn't think they were very good, just like an unripe peach isn't very good. Uh, so we started the Oregon Truffle Festival just with one simple mechanism to sort of redeem the Oregon truffles, which was to introduce truffle dogs. There were none in 2006 when they started the festival, and there may be a couple of thousand in Northwest now. Um, we just spent years recruiting trainers before you know, finally getting the right team to um, start a training seminar, and then, and then there were spin-off businesses, and lots of people are doing it. Uh, if we quit the festival now, the the truffle dog phenomenon would continue. It's been a great success. And uh, it has begun to drive the price of our truffles up to the point where this year we reached a milestone where I was selling truffles, Oregon truffles, for higher prices than I was paying for, your, for the French black truffles. Um, so the Oregon truffles have really entered the pantheon of, of world delicacies. Next point, they thrive in Douglas fir stands planted on farmland. They're not out in the industrial forest. They're in your backyard. Uh, you know, they're in town. They're in parks. They're, they're everywhere. Um, don't go digging up the parks. <laughs> um, they're, they're typically not on public land. They're on private land. So you, wherever you go, you need permission to harvest them. Uh, so, yeah, these are, these are, these are friendly, friendly things that live around people. And then... The observed habitat yields and prices suggest that they could become a viable commercial crop. So the habitat is something that we can create and manage, um, as opposed to some delicate organism that can only live in ancient trees and can't tolerate any intervention. Uh, the yields are, are um, easily high enough, and I'll demonstrate that later. And of course, we've, we've pushed the prices up to the point where it really can make sense to farm them. So I'll introduce these truffles a, a little. Um, the Oregon white truffles, and there's two species, the winter and spring, on, on this map are from like uh, Mendocino County, California, or actually uh, like Point Reyes National Seashore, all the way up into British Columbia. And since this graph was made, the range has actually been extended in both directions by, you know, a couple hundred miles. And it's it, this map, which is based on herbarium collections at Oregon State University, Suggested that there's really not much in British Columbia, but as soon as they got one truffle dog, they discovered 
organ travels everywhere, <laughs> everywhere they look, uh, right in, in town and in Vancouver and all the cities around there and on Vancouver Island. Oregon black truffles, uh, Lucantium carthusianum, uh, originally described in France beneath pine trees, and the uh, species epithet carthusianum refers to the Carthusian monastery where they were first found. Uh, it's not clear, I mean, uh, considering the truffles are dispersed by, you know, a mouse, that how did a mouse cross the Atlantic and then cross the continent and hold it all the way there before finally dropping some spores in our woods. So it, it, I think it's unlikely this is the same species, but so at this point it still has the same name. Uh, it has a similar geographic range from um, the just north of the Bay Area into California up into southern British Columbia. And this is also based on OSU herbarium collections. Um, so you notice this high concentration right around Corvallis. <laughs> uh, but these truffles are actually much, much more widespread and abundant, um, particularly up through the Puget Sound area than this, this map suggests. Both of these species uh, live almost exclusively with Douglas fir. The white truffles can occasionally live with true firs. And <laughs> I found some under a Deodor cedar a couple, well, last, last year. Over the last 20 years, we've done taste tests and we've done many, many of them and we've done them every year. Uh, and the results have never varied in the sense that Oregon truffles always, in every single one of these tests, have performed as well or better than their more famous European cousins. And we're not controlling for the age of the truffle or the truffle's condition. Um, so that this, this is hardly a, a rigorous study, but it does, I think, make the point. So in this, like looking at 2014, the famous Italian white truffle, the one that sells for $2,700 a pound uh, versus the Oregon black truffle here, the Oregon white truffle, and then the pecan truffle and the burgundy truffle. Uh, in this study, with 319 people participating, 14 disqualified because they expressed any knowledge of truffles. So I wanted naive judges. Uh, the Oregon black and Oregon white truffles both scored as well or better than the Italian white truffle. And I don't know if you can see the 2018 results, but in, or, yeah, in 2018 or 2019, whichever <laughs> it's covered up in my screen, uh, the Oregon white truffle actually um, beat the European species by a wide margin. So I, I wouldn't infer from this that Oregon truffles are better than the European species, but they're certainly better than their historic price and reputation suggests. So, so this is the evidence that suggested we, we have something of real value here that, that we, we, can, we can benefit from. Uh, Oregon white truffle habitat is something you've all seen. It's, an, I'll give you a definition here, which is Douglas fir between the ages of 15 and 30 years old, planted on pasture or farmland next to older Douglas fir trees. And it's typically in someone's backyard. So this, uh, it's, the, it's very dependent on the land use history. So you never, very seldom see this land use history on the industrial forest lands or on public lands. It's almost always on private land where, say, in this place, I would guess this land was used as pasture. And then because of changes in agricultural e economics and demographics, um, it was no longer made sense to graze cattle there. And over time, it was planted with Douglas fir. And that's where the Douglas, that's the situation where the Douglas fir thrive. And there's a lot of that habitat around the Willamette Valley. And as you head south, there's quite a bit of it around, say, Drain and Elkton. But further south than that, there isn't much. You, you don't see this this pattern of land use history so much anywhere south of, say, Roseburg, even though the truffles live all the way down to the Bay Area. Similarly, north of Puget Sound, you don't see very much of this kind of habitat. But in southwest Washington and in around the Willamette Valley, it's, it's very common and abundant. But as, the, as these trends kind of culminate, we're likely to see less of this kind of habitat created. So here's a farm that we've actually been, we have a, we had a kind of 
field laboratory where this eight acre rectangle right here, we have a hundred permanent study plots. And you can see this was pasture land. It was planted with the spur. Uh, it's about, let's say, 25 years old now. Um, and we uh, took a census of the truffles in these study plots over a seven year period. Let me see if I, oh. Oh, I see. So I'll, I'll talk about that census data in a little bit after I'm done talking about the habitat. So this is what that sand looks like for, from the outside and then underneath. So young Douglas fir trees. It's often characterized as overgrown Christmas tree farm, but that's actually not quite correct. This, is, this was planted at more of a 10 or 12 foot spacing. <coughs> and Oregon black truffle habitat is similar. With, the key difference is most of the white truffle habitat is on red soils, where most of the black truffle habitat is on black soils. So the soils in a, most of the black truffle habitat is the kind of thing you would want to plant a garden in. Typically, you can dig in the soil with your hands without a tool. It's very loose and fluffy. Uh, it doesn't tend to be as common in the Willamette Valley. You tend to have to go a little bit further out, both in, into the foothills of the Cascades and all the way through the coast range. So it's often in uh, old homesteads that have been abandoned for farming and planted with Douglas fir. Um, also places like Tillamook Burn had a lot of black truffles in their day when the trees were still young enough. Uh, and uh, places like uh, old burns around like burnt woods uh, or old pasture areas in say Kings Valley uh, and uh, Western Polk County have produced a lot of truffles over the years. And the, the, the trees are in many of those areas are kind of aging out of truffle production at this point. But this particular stand of trees, it's about 38 acres, it's in the coast range. Uh, based on just a one-time sampling of truffle production, we estimated there are about 1.5 tons of truffles there. And this is, <laughs> this was our final day of harvesting. These are my two truffle dogs. Uh, we only got six pounds of truffles, which was the worst showing of the of the season, and we called it quits. And this was in mid-May, several years ago. <laughs> it was just absolutely phenomenal. And this is my dogs like to eat truffles, so they had completely eaten their fill, and that's we still were getting say ten pounds per day in about three hours with two dogs. So this is the productivity survey data, and I haven't yet. Uh, we just finished the study and I haven't yet done all the data collection, so there's some years missing. But um, uh, the year and on, on the x axis is the yield of truffles in pounds based on uh, a sampling these 100 study plots representing 2% of the area. And we, would, we were actually raking the truffles pr prior to the ripening season, so we were getting a complete count and it, it's not without error there's certainly some truffles that were deeper that we didn't find um, and then there's the question of whether or not the raking itself impacts truffle production in the plot which the study doesn't address but uh, in this eight acre area in 2014 we got about 340 pounds of truffles it represents about 40 pounds 41 pounds of truffles per acre and uh, Considering that we've the, the prices have risen to the point where they're rivaling the European species, uh, where they're selling for four hundred to eight hundred dollars per pound, it's clear that someone could uh, make a good return from managing this crop. And on the, the photo on the right, that's the bags from each of the plots. You can see some of those uh, quart-sized bags are completely filled with truffles. The plots were nine feet in diameter, and some of them had more than 100 truffles. And some of them had more than a pound of truffles in a single nine foot diameter plot. And then of course the yields vary from one year to the next. And unfortunately, 20, um, 2020 is the year we had to stop the study and it probably would have doubled 2014. But just the, the weather conditions last summer were, were absolutely perfect for truffle production. And it wasn't necessarily that the truffles, there were more truffles, but they were much larger. So I'm guessing the yield would have been much higher. 
So to manage for this crop, if, if someone were to do it, uh, would be to manage the stand density. Um, truffles appear to be larger, more plentiful near edges and in relatively low density stands. Uh, so that's when I said that the Christmas tree farm isn't quite correct. Truffles can fruit in Christmas tree farms, but as soon as the canopy closes and the trees become spindly, the tr at least the winter white truffles disappear. Both the spring white truffles and the black truffles can, can hold out a little bit longer. But you may see an end of truffle production by the time that the stand of trees is 10 years old. And they might start production in year six and be finished at year 10. So to maintain truffle production in the sand would require thinning. And we have a couple of great examples right now where we have uh, truffle patches that were in good production and were thinned before production came to an end. So that they thinned in time. And we're seeing quite clearly that the truffle production continues after the thinning. And that's for white truffles. It's more complicated with the black truffles. It looks like with black truffles, the thinning causes at least a couple of years of interruption of truffle production. But it does, it can continue afterwards. Um, right now, <coughs> native organ truffles, none of them are irrigated anywhere. Uh, and clearly they don't need it but the yields fluctuate considerably from one year to the next and irrigation may be a way to get a more consistent yield and also probably a better yield with higher quality truffles that are larger uh, so that's something to test it's, uh, and then of course like any other organism they need all the same nutrients that the plant does um, and they they benefit from good soil uh, so there's lots of opportunity to, to research soil amendments and just um, agronomy to see if we can't boost production and quality. And here's, here's uh, the first irrigation experiment we started. Prices, so this is the same slide as before, but with the Oregon truffles added. The historical prices for rake truffles, and actually to this day, are among the lowest, least expensive truffles on the planet. And they, it's really the, the fact that our truffles were harvested with rakes for so many years has given the truffles a reputation as one of, it's essentially worth it, that they're an inexpensive substitute for the real thing. But when we introduced truffle dogs, it changed everything. Where the truffles, the dogs are doing the quality control. Every truffle you get is ripe. It's not perfect. You get some that are overripe and you, you still have to do quality grading. But they, they have shelf life um, and they're selling for prices that are absolutely in the realm of the other, the, of the European species that are being cultivated. So uh, say $400 a, a pound is a price you might charge to a distributor and $800 a pound is what the restaurant may, might pay. And certainly if you do some research on the web looking at dog harvested Oregon truffles, you see prices at the higher end of this range. So this, it's clear with a yield of, uh, say, 20 to 40 pounds per acre and these prices, there's no question a person can make a living. And the other thing to consider is that we're getting those yields with no intervention, with, with no management, no extra cost associated with managing this crop other than the time it takes to harvest, market, and ship. So there's no weed control, no pest control, no irrigation. And then of course, uh, something we're working on through the Oregon Truffle Festival is value added products. And there are a world, of, there is a world of possibilities here. So these are all things, that, these first two are things I saw in Europe. This is a body milk with truffles and then eggs, a carton of eggs infused with truffle aroma, which is the easiest thing in the world to make. It's, it's literally just what you see in this bottom picture. It, it's truffles. In, in this case, that bowl contains whipping cream with the lid. That's all you need. You put that in the refrigerator. The truffle aroma is fat soluble. It will actually accumulate and become stronger in the cream than it ever was in the truffle. So, and then you can still use the truffle for something else. You can serve it on a plate of food, but you've captured the aroma. And chefs understand this. The longer they have the truffle in their possession, the more value they can get out of it by infusing other foods with it. So that, uh, you know, we, we uh, just through the festival, we are co-branding truffle salami with Olympia, Olympic provisions. Um, 
and uh, a vodka with uh, uh, the name of the distillery is escaping me, a truffle beer, Wolves and People Brewery. So a lot of different possibilities for value-added products. Charles, so, yes. I just want to give you a time check. So we're just about at the end of our regular time. Uh, but I want to let folks know we're going to stay around for another 15 minutes because uh, there are more questions and we go into overtime. Um, so I just want to chime in and I'm going to put up a little, uh, just a poll. Uh, Charles, you can continue your presentation, but just want to check folks before they leave the room. If some people have to leave right on um, the 1130. Um, so I'm going to launch a poll that you can answer at your convenience while Charles continues and get close to some Q&A. Okay. Well, Thanks. my talk, I'm actually done myself. And the slide that's up here right now is uh, just additional resources. Um, the Oregon Truffle Festival, um, my company, New World Truffier, uh, the Oregon Culinary Truffles Feasibility Study that I've mentioned a couple of times is at oregontruffles.org. And then probably the best book on truffle farming generally that's published in English is Taming the Truffle by Ian Hall. Uh, and just a little bit more about the Oregon Truffle Festival. It takes place in January and February each year in Eugene and Newburgh and venues throughout the Willamette Valley. This coming year will be different. It will be very much like tree school <laughs> uh, with more online educational events. But we, we still plan to do the outdoor truffle dog trainings, the truffle hunting forays. Um, We'll have probably online cooking classes and the Truffle Growers Forum or the Truffle Farming A to Z class will be online. Um, so it's a place you can come to and in a normal year. You can come and experience truffles. It's an educational festival where the education may be just eating something really great. <laughs> so just wanted to say a little bit about that. And that's the conclusion of my talk. And you know, you should uh, feel free to contact me through this email address. Uh, if you have questions that weren't answered here. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you there. Just want to make sure we got folks before they left at the end of the regular time. But I think a lot of folks are going to be hanging around because now is a good time for Q&A and we have quite a few questions. Uh, as Charles said, the, you know, we'll, we'll post this show and also his resources and contact will be posted um, online so you can come back uh, and get that and the recorded version, uh, tell your friends to come see what they missed. So let's get back into some questions. Um, as far as these uh, Douglas fir truffles under Douglas fir, only west of the Cascades and Doug fir? Strictly west of the Cascades, yeah. They haven't, I'm not aware of them ever showing up anywhere on the east side, even though Douglas fir obviously continues on the east side. All right, and here's a good one. I've never had a truffle. What are they used for? What kind of recipes? Uh, are there some recipes you could uh, refer us to? Um, yes. <laughs> e eaten raw or sauteed or? I think the, the single best way to, to try truffles for the first time is just to shave them raw over macaroni and cheese. That works with any truffle species. You just shave it on while the macaroni and cheese is still hot. Let it sit there a while for the truffle to kind of soak into the cheese. Uh, let it give off its aroma into the cheese for just a minute. And you can really get the sense of the truffle that way. But truffles, are the aroma is fat soluble. It's all about the aroma. So whatever you serve them in needs to be something that has some fat. But it can be even something like an avocado has enough fat to absorb truffle aroma. So eggs, uh, eggs, of course, are a very traditional way to serve truffles. Pasta with any kind of oily sauce. Uh, they can be, they're often served in salads with a, a vinaigrette that has the oil and the truffle aroma. Um, just recently we had some on the pizza and the pizza pro is problematic because often uh, uh, the cheese isn't melty enough by the time it reaches your table and the truffle just sits there on top and doesn't infuse the cheese. But if you drizzle some olive oil over the truffle slices at, just after you put them on the pizza, then all the aroma that slice of truffle is giving off is captured right away. So that, that worked really well. Um, yeah, there are a world of ways to serve truffles. They right. can go well with a lot of foods. Uh, could you switch to that slide that advertises the next show? I want to do that for everyone. 
uh, anyone leaves. Uh, just to promote what's coming next this afternoon, kind of similar vein, the special products, goods from the woods, uh, you know, things other than timber, but or wood, wood and non-timber related. So um, that's this afternoon at three o'clock with Neil Schroeder for the Oregon Woodland Co-op. So back to questions. Um, will a truffle dog be able to pick up on all types or do they have their own sense and need to be trained for the specific type of truffle? That's a good question. And uh, it's not uncommon for an untrained dog to find truffles. They're, they're just kind of strange smelling things in the soil that dogs are often interested in exploring. So uh, often that's problematic if, what you're, if you're looking for a specific species and the dog is finding just everything. Truffles are extraordinarily abundant. And, uh, there may be 300 species in Oregon. They're just, in terms of biomass, they're just as abundant as mushrooms are above ground. So they're really everywhere. Uh, so most truffle harvesters just only reward their dog for finding the truffles they want. And the, so the dogs tend to ignore anything else. A few of us want the dogs to find new things that we've never seen before. And so we reward them for finding any truffle at all. Um, so my dogs, have I can go out hiking any time of year i can go any place the dogs will always find truffles and it's always something interesting and a lot of really interesting aromas like juicy fruit gum or sewer gas or <laughs> everything in between um and there's there's a there, there are a lot of interesting truffles out there that probably do have culinary value but it's not yet established because the truffle isn't common enough or isn't big enough something like that so it depends on how you train the dog is the answer, short answer. Very good. Um, if one does not have a truffle dog, how can one find these? Um, and also then, what about uh, truffle rakes and the damage question? Oh, sure. So it, it's easy to find truffles with a rake. You can go out in the woods anywhere and start raking and you'll often come across truffles. But um, they're unlikely to have their culinary value just because they'll sit in the ground for months before they ripen and you can harvest them at any point during that time. But if they're not ripe, they're not worth eating. Uh, so it's like uh, the North American Truffling Society goes out on forays once a month um, based in Corvallis. You can look them up and they use rakes. And, but the point is different. They're, they're trying to find new species and document where things are and, you know, explore the world of truffles generally. And a rake is an appropriate way to do that. Um, if you're trying to get truffles for culinary use, you really, the dog is really the best way to do it. The one sort of hybrid is to look for places where squirrels have dug holes and dig around there. Often the animal looking for the truffle is smaller than the truffle is. <laughs> so there's, it can only eat so much before it, it's full and some of the truffle is left in the hole. Uh, Sometimes you can find truffles up in the branches of trees, in fact. <laughs> so yeah, they don't need a dog, but if you're harvesting them for culinary use, uh, it's the best way to go. And then re regarding the raking and the damage to the environment, uh, <laughs> almost all federal lands prohibit truffle hunting for that reason, that it's, you can't get a permit to harvest truffles on federal land, with the exception, I believe, possibly the uh, Salem district of the BLM uh, included truffle harvesting in, in an environmental impact statement they were doing, and, and at least they used to offer permits for truffle harvesting in their district. Otherwise, uh, it's an issue. It's a soil disturbance that the um, federal land agencies can't permit, can't allow without without doing their environmental impact statement. And then, of course, the, um, on private land, yeah, the poachers, truffle poachers, have caused incredible damage and really it really angered a lot of landowners because of it. But uh, in most situations, considering that it was farmland and it was being impacted by people already, and then it was planted with trees, the raking doesn't seem like that terrible of a disturbance. This is a young, simple um, uh, ecosystem. It's not like you're raking in an old growth forest where you have uh, interconnections that have taken centuries to develop. Uh, so I think the environmental impact is um, less severe than it might be under other circumstances. Okay. What is the shelf life of Oregon truffles? Uh, with harvesting with a dog, it can vary anyway from, say, one day to two weeks. 
uh, it all depends on how the truffles are handled. And that's a, a subject for another talk, uh, how to handle and care for Oregon truffles. The key thing to understand is that they're alive, they need oxygen. Um, they also need to remain hydrated and they can't be allowed to stay wet on the surface. <laughs> so it's tricky. You have to maintain a high humidity environment that's well oxygenated uh, and then blot the truffles dry anytime any moisture develops on their surface. What about damage? Uh, again, the compacted soil. Someone just had that question again and reiterate what the, the you know, for the compacted the, soil from tractors yeah. or, or logging equipment. Um, compaction is, is definitely bad for truffle production, just as it is for the growth of the tree. Uh, interestingly, though, the white truffles in particular often will, will be fruiting in the, in the skid rows. <laughs> So they, they just fruit in the kind of at the interface of the mineral and duff layers of the soil. So they're, they're, so it's a common phenomenon that you find white truffles commonly in the skid rows. And I think it may have something to do with the, because there was a road there, the trees actually have a little bit more light than they do in the interior. So it's a little bit of an edge habitat. So, but com, there's no question that compaction harms truffle production, but under some circumstances, the, the truffles can still benefit from the opening. I think a general thing is to minimize it, but uh, there will be some, and, and there's some edge effect that might actually be beneficial as long as there's not yeah. too much. Um, what, what's the seasonality? Why can you only harvest within three months or can you harvest all year? Uh, it depends on the truffle. So the winter white truffle, the season varies from one year to the next, depending on the weather. This, uh, there's speculation that the truffles don't start to ripen until there has been some frost. And this past year we had frost in late October and a very early ripening of the truffles, which sort of supports that, that lore. Um, but typically we see the truffles start to ripen in say mid January and go through the beginning of April, but it can start ripening. They can start ripening as early as the or say Thanksgiving and just finish by the end of February. That's the winter white truffles. So, and also the season varies from one patch to another by as much as a month. Even patches that are close to each other if they're on say a north or a south aspect. For the spring white truffles, the season is May, June, July. <coughs> Although it, it looks like the season is almost done for this year already. It was again, an early season. The Oregon black truffles fruit year round. You can find them every month. Uh, they're most, they become kind of abundant in October, but they, and they also appear to go through uh, pulses or flushes in the soil. So we, we tend to see a October, November flush, and then they sort of often disappear through December and early January, then come back in late January and February, and then another lull. And then the peak season in terms of quality and productivity is April, May. Uh, but then you, you find stragglers throughout the rest of the summer. And it, it depends on the weather, of course. Uh, if there's been a fair amount of moisture or if they're sub-irrigated somehow, then uh, you can see better production where the drier sites will have no production in the summer. Uh, oh, and then one other, the Oregon brown truffle also fruits year-round, and its peak season may be around September. Someone had a general question about would we find truffles uh, or success with truffles in the Estacada area. So just kind of looking at the maybe soils and climate going up. In towards yes, the absolutely. Cascades. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, when you're out with your dogs, what do you carry? Uh, trowel, other tools, how deep in the soil are truffles? Truffles can be anywhere from breaking the surface or even up in the branches of the trees. So <clears throat> sometimes you can just see them as you walk through the forest. To most truffles I would say are between one and three inches deep. But occasionally, oh, my dog spent half an hour digging up a truffle this past spring that was easily two feet deep. The dogs were completely underground by the time they found the truffle. They're dedicated. <laughs> it took both dogs digging in this hole and I, I could just tell from their body language that it really was a truffle and not a mouse. Uh, and sure enough, there was a truffle maybe the size of a walnut all the way down there. <laughs> All right, Augusta, another one minute left. This is like a 
stopwatch. How would you, how do you know a ripe truffle? Ah, great question. A ripe truffle has aroma. It's very distinctive. It's not subtle. It's overpowering. Uh, an unripe truffle has no aroma at all. Uh, so that's just a world of difference. The a rake truffle and a dog harvested truffle are obvious. They, they cannot be confused for each other by someone who knows truffles. Very good. Okay, one, one more for uh, uh, that, related to that. A strong sewer-like smell in my forest can't be able to localize. Could that have been a truffle? It could. Uh, there's a, a genus called Gaudiaria. It's very common. You would tend to find that in more sandy, you know, excessively well-drained or rocky soils. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very powerful truffle. You don't want to have them in your car. Okay, so it could, it could be either that or somebody's septic system. One more yeah, question, and we're down to the wire. For infusing sure. food, an ideal ratio of truffles to food, tried in the past, uh, butter, oil, don't think we had enough truffles. What does it take? No, I don't, you know, I haven't done that research. Uh, certainly the more truffles you have, the, the more aroma you get out of them. Also, the riper the truffle, the, the more aroma. Um, but, wow, it, if you have a pound of truffles in your refrigerator, everything in there, including the ice cream in the freezer, will, will taste like truffles six months later. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's just a matter of time, but uh, maybe you have to experiment. Well, Charles, this, this has been great. And obviously folks stayed to the end because there's a lot of good questions. And thank you so much uh, for doing this online. And um, if you want to see his presentation or refer it to your friends, just look for tree school at uh, knowyourforest.org. And thank you, Charles. My pleasure. Yep. All right. Goodbye, everyone.